thing I saw when I checked my calendar after saying yes to being here today is that today is a Jobs Friday. It's what we call in the office a Jobs Friday. It's that one time a month where the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us where jobs stand in this country. And I thought how fitting that Opportunity International is doing its summit on a day where we in this country are looking at, to everybody, the single most important thing to so many people, it is the jobs. It is having one. It is being able to know that there is something in your future, that you can create things in your future, that you can create things for yourself, your family, and your community with a job. And I thought, how fitting that a group whose mission is to create that opportunity around the world is doing its big event on the day that we're focusing on that here in this country. As part of my job covering business and economics for really the last eight years at CNBC and then CBS and now ABC, I have seen so many faces of so many people who that light goes off, the light that Carly mentioned, getting that job, having that opportunity, that's the difference. It is knowing that you have ownership over something in your life. It is knowing that you have the power to build something for yourself, for your family, and your community. And as I was listening to Vicki talking about the initiatives, agriculture, education, jobs, loans, even solar energy, even fighting disease, what do all of them have in common? They have opportunity and they have ownership. The ability for somebody to know that they have a stake in this. It's not that somebody else or some other thing just has a stake in you. It's knowing that you have a stake and that you through your work and your efforts can accomplish something great. And what I've always been drawn to with Opportunity International is that holistic approach and that sense, and we've been hearing it so much already this morning, but that sense of this isn't just charity. This is about handing an opportunity to people around the world to make something bigger. So I'm honored to be here today and delighted to be here today. And so proud and inspired by your work. Those 12 million jobs, you know, we're all taught in my business to talk about stories, to think about the people, the experiences, and to share information in that way. But 12 million jobs? 12 million jobs is something that if, if we just created 12 million jobs in this country, people would be applauding. So to do it around the globe in places where the infrastructure and the reality is nowhere near what we have already going for us here is a massive accomplishment. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here today and I'm honored for the conversation that we're about to have here on the stage. And I wanna turn it over to that conversation now because you're gonna be hearing from the stakeholders in this, the people who are in the trenches who are making it happen every day. And this next discussion we're going to have is called True Impact. It's an issue of great importance to our panelists. And I wanna invite them to the stage now, Lizelle Pritzker-Simmons and Kevin Compton, who are two of Opportunity International's strongest supporters. And as they come up to the stage, I'll just give you a little background on both Lizelle and Kevin as they come up. Lizelle Pritzker-Simmons is Opportunity International's Young Ambassadors for Opportunity, a global network of young professionals who are passionate about microfinance. She is the co-founder and principal of Blue Haven Initiative, which is a family office dedicated to investing in for-profit and non-profit capital to advance solutions to social and environmental challenges. Kevin Compton is co-founder of Radar Partners, which is an early stage venture capital partnership and was a partner with Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers, which is one of Silicon Valley's most successful high-tech venture capital firms for almost 20 years. Over the past 30 years, Kevin and his partners invested in many of the most powerful and high-profile startups, 
I won't ask you for investment advice today, <laughs> maybe after. Uh, but they were involved in Google, AOL, Compaq, and Amazon.com. And Kevin has been ranked by Forbes as one of the top private investors in the world and has been named Midas Touch top 10 to that list three times. So I want to welcome them and we'll get started. Thanks, guys. So I really wanted to start first on philosophy, the philosophy of philanthropy. And Lizelle, why don't you begin by explaining that because you've been involved in Opportunity International for so many years. What, what drove that decision? I think that what attracted me to Opportunity's approach and, and what resonates with kind of my own theory of philanthropy is I sort of think, you know, I think good things happen in the world when there's a strong three-legged stool, right? When you've got good governments doing good things for people, you've got business doing good things for people, and then you also need philanthropy, I think, to fill in the gap where business and government are falling short or maybe don't see an opportunity that, that is needed. And for me, my philanthropy um, sort of takes that shape and, and really in the form of risk taking. So how do you make business better? So microfinance is a sustainable solution to poverty. A good microfinance organization should be self-sustaining. They should be able to pay their staff. They should be able to um, keep their portfolio at risk down because that's the system that they're in. However, what doesn't happen sometimes in that is the risk taking, trying out things like weather indexed crop insurance, trying out things like lending to schools. Um, how do you partner with community health worker organizations? How do you look at other goods and services that can be administered through this really great sustainable distribution channel but maybe a traditional bank might say, I don't know, that's actually not inside of our business model right now. So philanthropy can say, okay, we'll provide that risk capital and let's test it out and let's figure it out. Let's find a way to make it sustainable. Maybe we don't need a return in the short term, but in the long term, this is gonna be part of our philosophy. And so to me, I like trying to find philanthropic opportunities that just give a boost to a system that should then either go into good business, like microfinance, or good governance. How do you convince those two organizations that serving the social good is actually really better for both? And so in my perfect world, you may not need that philanthropy because you know, I think forward-thinking governors and forward-thinking business people would want to include that risk capital already in their budgets, but that's okay. In the meantime, people like you all will step in and prove it first. <laughs> Kevin, your entire life's work has been about finding solid investments, investments that pay. What about Opportunity International attracted you, and what makes it such a solid investment? Well, about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I was approached by someone from Opportunity, you know, kind of the, you set a part of your day aside to help people, and somebody came in to make the pitch to raise money, and I, I kind of said, look, um, if you'll show me something that's scalable, that is repeatable, and that is sustainable, then I'll get interested. And I said that to everybody that kind of came through that period, and most of them never came back because they either didn't like me or didn't understand what I said. <laughs> um, but... Uh, the people from Opportunity came back and they came back in droves and said, that's exactly who we are. And I said, okay, well, my wife and I are looking for things. We're not big on handouts. We're big on hand ups. We want to help people, but we don't want to just write checks because we don't think that works. We come from the Midwest. We're hard workers. And my family, when I was growing up, if you tripped and fell, my mom would say, don't just lay there and do push-ups. You know, you just, it was work. <laughs> work, work. And um, so we really wanted that approach to it. And so when Opportunity came to us and showed us a way that we really are just investing in people. And if, back to your point, Rebecca, we're, as a venture person, you invest in people. And if you saw Vicki and, and uh, Carly and you two this morning, 
as the token male here, I can say we're investing <laughs> well in people. And that's or what women, as it were. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's what it was about for me. It was a, a chance to invest in people, take the venture model that I think I understood pretty well, and apply that to a people in need. And I know, Kevin, you championed the Campaign for Africa that raised $130 million. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Gail and I, again, when we, when we agreed to do that after saying no 11 times, um, <laughs> we, uh, we really thought that that was a chance to, to try to put something, a, a big stake in the ground. And, and, and I had talked to a lot of friends who were doing big things in philanthropy, a lot of well-known people. And I asked them, and they told me to focus and take on something that was going to be really hard. And so this one came our way, and, and we decided to do it. And Opportunity International did all the work. They surrounded themselves uh, with, with unbelievable investors. They put together the plan. And the two interesting things that happened to it is, one is we changed the word from donation to investment. And we really believed in that. We believed we were investing in people. And then the interesting thing is we had this long um, discussion in 2007, 2000, early 2008, about what name we should use. And I wanted the phrase investing in Africa. And the group wanted banking. Um, in Africa. So in the end, the banking name won over the investing name. And I lost again. And then in September of that year, the banking crisis hit. Mm. And we had this gigantic forum a few months later. And I remember in a panel like this, someone came to me and said, now are you sorry? And this was probably early 2009. Are you sorry you chose the name banking? And I said, no, I'm thrilled because I learned something in that process. I learned how important it is to have something we in America took for granted for 100 years, which is a reliable banking system. And when ours broke, I watched big, famous people get really scared. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's really weird. Because so think how it is in an emerging economy, how important that banking element is, a place to put money and have trust and have faith that when you put it in, you can get it back out. And so. Uh, it was a great campaign. It really worked well. And I think it's, it's met its goal of establishing banking for those countries we focused on. Now that we have banking, we can focus on jobs. And Liesel, you've you focused very heavily also on metrics, on being able to look at these things and say, yes, we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Well, yeah, one of. Um over the years, uh, I've given grants to Opportunity for various things, and one of them most recently that I'm really, really excited about is around um, the performance metrics piece of things. And this comes at a really great time now that the organization, as Vicki and Carly pointed out, is a global organization where um, there's really a, a management structure that supports that. Now you can start to look across the portfolio of banks and say, OK, what's important to this organization? What, what's important to the clients? And how can we have all of the members of the staff and team constantly working towards those type, types of metrics? And so um, I, I am really excited to see now where that's going to go, because I think it's important for a global organization to have you know, some standards so that the people in, in Colombia and in Malawi feel like they're working towards the same goal. And when you have those kinds of metrics, um, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's just it's a good way to run your business. But I also think what is also really important about that is that it's a way to listen to clients and see what's working. Um, I remember several years ago when I was doing an insight trip in Ghana, and we were learning about you know, just at the beginning of the edu finance program and when they were just beginning to lend to schools and asking about how that sort of started. And one of the loan officers was saying, well, really what happened was I was having a a conversation with one of the clients and realized that they were taking their loan for their yam stand business and funneling it off to the side and actually had started a school with that money. But they kind of, they didn't apply for a loan for the school because that product didn't exist. And 
it probably would have been confusing to the loan officer. And but the, then the loan officer in this conversation was like, well, wait a minute. That's actually a terrific use of funds. That's a great thing. That's totally in keeping with what this organization is all about. Maybe I should talk to my manager and let's figure out, like, maybe we can lend to you. And those kinds of conversations shouldn't just happen anecdotally on the side. They should be things that loan officers are constantly looking for and constantly tracking and constantly going back to management and saying, wait a minute, I think we need, I think we need a new loan product because we've got clients that are innovating faster than our product development team is. And those are the kinds of things that you can systematically at least begin to capture um, when you have those kinds of reporting systems in place and when then you can share that information across banks and across countries and across languages um, and have a database system that can help do that. And so that's why I'm particularly excited about, about supporting that work. You're touching on a really important element of all of this, which is sustaining the momentum. You've built it. They've come. But how do you keep them coming back? And how do you keep having successes following the initial successes of the project? What have you seen, Liesel, that has really helped sustain momentum? I mean, I would say something that has been a theme all throughout this morning, and, and Kevin mentioned as well, it's about people. It's about, I mean, how you create a sustainable solution is have a vision and have meaning behind that, and then have a group of people who are constantly working towards achieving that vision. That's sustainability. The rest of it is in the details. You know, and that's what I really see. I think, I think what is the most exciting about this organization is wherever you go in the world, and wh whoever, from the branch managers to the loan officers to the clients, have a sense of purpose around what it is that they're doing and, the, and, and why these loans are important. And loan officers feel a sense of, of duty around their clients and their portfolio and what everybody is working towards. And that's sustainability in a large organization with tons of branches and all kinds of different governance structures. That's really the key thing. And so to me, that's what I find the most exciting. And you've heard it all this morning um, uh, from, from, from various people. And they're the people on the ground. You mentioned those, those loan officers. These oh, are, yeah. These are not kiosks set up with some internet provider somewhere in some other place. These are the people on the ground yeah. making it happen. Kevin, you, you touched on the idea of first it was banking and now it's jobs. And it strikes me that there is, for an, for an organization so large, so expansive, Opportunity International has been very nimble to adapt to the needs of the communities in which it serves. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the great things I've seen on some trips we've been on to uh, Africa and things, my wife and I, we went to some trust group meetings. We went. To, one of the mistakes I made early on in the in the uh, Africa campaign is, you know, as a venture guy, when you're, you know, the story, everything looks like a nail. You know, <laughs> I um, I really wanted to create 150,000 some number of entrepreneurs, and Early in the program, someone sat me down and said, you're not going to like this, but not everybody's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, we need to back the entrepreneurs, and then they'll create jobs. So I immediately stole that idea and started telling everybody that we were going to create a <laughs> bunch of entrepreneurs, but they were going to create the infrastructure. And I think that's how the nimbleness you mentioned, Rebecca, has really worked, is that we put the banks in business, the banks put people in business, and the people hired people. And therefore, it became really scalable and really repeatable in a way that I never envisioned. Because I saw you know, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs, and they saw hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs. And I think that's the flexibility mm -hmm. that just naturally happened um, by not trying to overmanage the process. I think another great thing Opportunity does, and, uh, and this, is, you know, this is, you can tell from Carly all, all the way through, they believe in you know, low-level accountability and low-level freedom. Let people in the field make the decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the nimbleness has happened. 
Where do you see Opportunity International, Kevin, making the biggest impact going forward? Uh, in creating this environment and creating, to your phrase, opportunity. Uh, the creating opportunity for people by giving them the chance to, to get in, get their business started, and then surround themselves with other people who can make them better and create work. We, in the for opening video, we saw the woman making the hammocks, how she hired more and more people. And I think that's where the scale, that's where the opportunity, that's where everything comes from, is giving people who want to be the entrepreneur the chance. But in any business, I mean, I, 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 Silicon Valley is so equity oriented, meaning we don't talk a lot about debt and loans. Hmm. We all talk about ownership, and that's good. <clears throat> But business works off the back of a banking structure and a loan infrastructure and financing people. Uh, people, a lot of times, when they come to see me after their company's growing so fast, and they say, you know, we're exceeding our plans and we're growing really well, but we're going to need more capital. And I say, exactly. When your growth rate exceeds your profit margin, you're going to burn money. And that's OK. We'll do that every day. And uh, investing in these people to, to create businesses, to create jobs, therefore create an economy. That's what it's all about. How about you, Lisa? <clears throat> I think um, there's, and, and this is already starting, but what I think is super, super exciting is the um, potential and, and possibility for partnerships. I think when you've got an organization like Opportunity International that is in as many countries as they're in with the infrastructure that they have and the client reach that they have, you're naturally going to attract partners. So if you're lending to schools, you're gonna have teacher training programs that are like, please, can we use your network? Can we use your distribution channels? Um, Vicki mentioned you know, healthcare as well. There's you know, solar financing types of products that people need. I think it would be awesome if we started getting into housing finance as well, because I think that's, that is, um, uh, particularly a lot of my portfolio is focused in, in East Africa and um, the housing finance market, if you actually want to move out of a slum and into a home, you can't get financing for that. It's very difficult and we know in this country how important housing finance was in the 50s and 60s that led to a really stable middle class. And then bad things happened with housing finance later on. but. Um, but good housing finance um, is a really powerful tool for a stable, uh, a stable society. And so things like that, I think that, that, that the, the banks will continue to partner and innovate around um, are, are great opportunities when you've got the reach that this organization has. You're naturally going to attract um, these really sort of innovative partners and really be able to be provide a holistic, I mean, they already do, but even more so a holistic suite of services for the clients. Uh, thinking about those partnerships and thinking about, since both of you have extensive work in Africa, I think on the top of people's minds right now when they think of Africa, and in particular West Africa, is Ebola. And I wonder if either of you have given thought to how that potential epidemic might have an impact on the work and what might be done to try to keep the great things that Opportunity International is doing going in light of the fact that people have this additional thing to worry about that is deadly. It's a big topic, I get that. No, it is, uh, and so I hadn't thought specifically, Rebecca, to your question about how it affects opportunity, but I had thought a lot about the work we had done there and the things we had seen as we've been to Rwanda and Uganda, and my wife's been to Ghana, and we've been around that part of the world, uh, Kenya, and um, I thought to myself, oh, you know, we hear about the, what's happened in Dallas now right. with, I thought, well, you know, we have a really great infrastructure for handling this. We have a healthcare system. We have good housing. We have good sanitation. We have good water. We have, it shouldn't get out of hand here quickly. Well, wouldn't that be great if I could say the same thing about West Africa? Mm -hmm. If I could just say that same sentence and mean it, it kind of re-energized me to say, and that's going to happen if we create an economy, we create jobs, we create infrastructure, we create education. The same kind of education that will help them be better in business will help them be better in understanding how to handle something like this when it comes their way. And I also think that, you know, I was talking earlier about that three-legged stool, and this is one where 
you know, rapid response to emergencies like this really highlight where you have good governance and, and, and bad governance um, and how governments respond to these kinds of things. And so I think that, that this is a case where, um, you know, the very best microfinance organization cannot solve for this problem and shouldn't be. Um, this is what, what governments and then rapid response philanthropy can help to step in and, and um, address. But at the same time, um, being able to provide at least good cushioning mm -hmm. for families when an emergency strikes um, you know, Ebola is a little difficult because it, it sort of takes over entire communities. But one thing that I do like about Opportunity is, is, is the insurance products um, that they have. And some of those, unfortunately, are around life insurance and funeral insurance. And how do you have an event, a death in a family, not completely devastate that family for several years after mm -hmm. because of funeral costs? Um, and so I think considering those kinds of products and developing those kinds of products are very helpful to clients, but it doesn't, I mean, that they can't solve the sort of the, the political risk of not having good emergency response services in these countries, and that's a broader development problem um, that's, I think, slightly out, outside the scope of this organization, but is equally important. You can't do business in a country if people are dying of Ebola, whether you're a yam stand owner or whether you're Google. You can't. I think it's a really interesting point, though, that both of you are making, which is the work of Opportunity International is helping to build that infrastructure to be better equipped. It's not, it's really, really big, but to be better equipped mm -hmm. to weather these storms, which right now it's Ebola. Unfortunately, the, the future is this big question mark and it could be something just as bad. Um, the two of you both started out your involvement with Opportunity International as donors, but you have really, I mean, you've gotten your hands dirty. You're, you're, you're not just, like you said, Kevin, it's not just about writing checks. What was it that made you want to do more? Well, for us, it was, it was the chance to see, um, uh, again, the business model that we believe in applied philanthropically so that we could put investment into people's lives and watch them get themselves, uh, you know, the, the, the look that people get when they succeed, uh, when they make something happen. That was really what got us going. And then we have been lucky enough to go on some uh, trips, uh, and we've been able to sit in trust group meetings uh, if you've ever really wondered if this works, go sit in a trust group meeting in a back area of a market in, in Uganda. I have help. Um, <laughs> in Uganda. And, and, you know, I'm kind of a big guy, and my wife's, you know, good Midwest farm girl. We were terrified where we were going. Um, and we were walking back and through this market, and we back, and we came into this this trust group meeting, and they were sitting back there, and, and the most fascinating part of it, well, there were so many fascinating parts I could go forever on, but the most fascinating part for me was you'd always heard about the group accountability of a trust group. We went to a session where someone was, had missed two meetings and was late on a payment. I was a partner at Kleiner Perkins with some of the toughest people you'll ever meet in your life for many, many years, and I've had to stand up in front of them and say, remember that idea I told you that was such a great idea a few years ago? Turns out you guys were wrong. Um, but, and stand up and tell them about that. It's a really joyous moment in your life, and I've had to do it a few times. <laughs> I would do that again in a second before I would stand in that trust group and tell them I'm two weeks behind on my payments. <laughs> in a second. Those people stared at that poor man and asked him what he was going to do about it and what he was going to do to fix it. And let me tell you, he was wearing a tie and shaking. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, and he was answering the questions. That works. That accountability, that local support, that's why we decided to even up our investment more, is it works. Yeah, I think, I think for me, there, there are just so many um, 
so many aspects of, of the sort of poverty that are addressed by what Opportunity International does, and that interests me greatly. Um, there's how do you um, how do you build sort of solid financial services products that serve people at the base of the pyramid? Um, how does that play into a larger banking ecosystem that involves World Bank, that involves Africa Development Bank? Um, and I think that's really fascinating. Um, how does you know that man standing up at that meeting actually play all the way up to global finance structures because it really does. And I think um, I, I, those things really kind of get me going. And then also, how do you connect what's happening at those trust group meetings with um, a broader audience you know, here in Chicago or here in the US? And that's why um, the donor engagement piece and the Young Ambassadors for Opportunity is, is also really important to me. People should know that those are conversations that are happening. People should know that you know, there are many, many families that can only afford to send one of their five children to school today. That's, that's important to know. Um, and so I think that, that that's also what has kept me really engaged. It changed my life when I learned about that. And I think it will change other people's lives too, but people need to have that experience and in, in my hope early on in life so that you can then make decisions about what you do every day and think about how that impacts other people that you haven't met yet and maybe aren't even born yet. I'm sure in, in both of you, and we heard the story from Kevin, but in your travels, you have come across stories that have really moved you. And uh, if both of you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear some of those stories. Uh, uh, so I'll take another one from uh, the great one. We, we talked about the, the value of banking um, and the banking system. We heard a story from a bank manager in Rwanda where um, a woman had gotten into a trust group uh, and had gotten her loan approved and had gotten roughly uh, $100. I don't remember the exact amount. And she got her identity card and her thumbprint and her basically an ATM card. And I don't know if you know the culture, but keeping cash on hand in that part of the world is not a good idea because uh, if your family members come by and say, I need $50 and you have it in cash, then you, you give it to them. However, if it's in the bank, they don't expect you to give it to them. And I didn't quite understand the nuance there, but I was fine with that and trusting that and talked to the bank officer. And he told me a story of a woman who came in and who had gotten her loan and gotten the money in the account and went into the ATM and withdrew the equivalent of $20 and left. And came the back the next day and deposited the $20. Came back the next day and withdrew the $20. Came back the fourth day and deposited the $20. And the bank officer told us the story. He said, ma'am, you can do that every day for the length of your loan if you'd like. But is there something I can help you with? And she said, I just wanted to make sure this really worked. <laughs> <laughs> and it was changing that mentality that there's a, there's a system that you can trust for your capital that really, again, told me this works. This really mm -hmm. changes the way they think. And believing in that system, knowing yeah. that it will be there for you. And, and again, it's something we don't understand. We got a glimpse of it in 2008 that when the banking system may not work and you may go and put your ATM card in mm -hmm. and they may say, sorry. Um, you know, it's a big difference. I, um, one story that, that sticks with me, um, it's a little sort of harrowing, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, so I was sitting in a, a meeting with, um, so part of our foundation was partnered with Opportunity International and one of their banks in Ghana um, around uh, the, Edu finance, and so this was a meeting of um, school owners that were coming into the branch office, and um, they do weekly trainings uh, in sort of school management and sort of best practices and how to run their school. And so I was sitting in, into one of these meetings, and one of the things that they're taught um, in in this sort of capacity building workshop is, um, you know, look at your 
at look at your attendance rates and train your teachers in your schools to really watch you know, who's coming into school, um, how often they're coming. And this should be a metric that, that, you, um, that you track every day. And so every, the homework assignment was to go make sure all your teachers were looking at their attendance rates and come back anyway. Um, one of the owners came in and was saying, okay, so we did this. And one of the teachers then came to me and realized um, that they, had, they hadn't been tracking the attendance before. It was just sort of, you know, some kids came on some days, some kids came on the others. Anyway, one of the kids was sort of consistently showing up late, and um, this was an eight-year-old girl, and she was always very sort of tired and sleeping through class when she came in. Um, and then some days she didn't show up at all. And so one of the things that the owners of the schools were trained to do is say, well, if kids aren't coming, then the teachers, it's your job to go knock on their door and see why they're not coming in. And so the teacher did this. And then what the teacher learned was that this little girl was basically being prostituted all night and wasn't coming in because she was too tired. And after discovering this, the teacher then went to another community leader and they intervened in this situation and um, brought other parents from the school and, and kind of addressed this issue on the community level. And anyway, the, the owner of the school was telling this to the rest of the school owners that were in her group just to show this is more than just whether or not your students have paid their school fees. We actually are watching out for these kids when they're in school. These are very poor communities, and it is our responsibility to look out for these kids. And so what seems like a really basic tool for tracking school fees is actually a much, much deeper responsibility that we have as school owners. And so was kind of encouraging everybody to, to continue to do this and how important it was. And I remember kind of sitting there and you just, you know, you start hearing enough of these stories and you start, um, you start realizing that taking the time to really, in these trust group meetings and in these training sessions, um, is hugely valuable. It's, it's not just whether or not they're given you know, this loan and this amount and paying it back on time, but really what's the dialogue that's happening around it. And um, that, that really sticks with me. I mean, that's, that's a little girl's life that happened because someone just started taking attendance. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, those are really, those stay with you. Absolutely. It reminds me of the proverb, to save one life, you yeah. save the entire world. And this business, it, it's not always a clean, nice, yeah. everybody feels good all the time. You hear stories, you see stories like this, and they're heartbreaking, and you know that what you're seeing is only a tiny slice of the reality. So I wonder what it is then that keeps you going in this fight? What it is that helps motivate you? I, don't, I mean, I, for me, I just feel like there's, uh, I'm the luckiest person I know, hands down, and every day I'm reminded of that, and I feel that deeply and that gratitude. And so I think that, um, that, I don't know, I was always taught that that is a responsibility and an obligation, and how can you use all of the wonderful things that, that you've been given um, to, to think creatively and innovatively around um, how can other people sort of have that too? And that's just, it's, it's not an option to not, <laughs> to not sort of think that way, I think. Um, and to find other people who are doing really amazing things and really support what they're doing. And so uh, there's, there's, there's too, too many wonderful things that people are doing that should, there should be more of, I think. Kevin? Uh, lots of things. One is, I'm so proud of this one here. When I've known her for seven, eight years now, and she and our daughter were at the forefront of founding <laughs> Yao. Uh, they did this. They, 
got me to do a fundraiser for them in New York. They've done crazy things. They went to Tanzania together, and I remember someone asked me, are you worried about those two going to Tanzania alone? And I said, no, but I'm praying for the Tanzanians. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I actually, I actually do want to say, uh, Rebecca, it's both sides. I love hearing stories about the school. I love the stories we've seen firsthand. Uh, and I love seeing what happens to the donors and the uh, mm -hmm. excitement and the energy and the, and the joy they get out of being a part of the solution. And when you meet people who will tell you the stories, um, I won't give the long version, I'll give the 30-second the, the version of it, but uh, a woman that my wife met early on in Ghana one time, the, the story came back through the loan officer. She was one of those ones who had, who had taken a loan out and had turned her life around and had, had, had grown a business and she was approached by one of the community leaders and said, well, your business is doing well. You have employees now. You need to pay taxes. <laughs> and she said, what are taxes? <laughs> and they said, OK, that's for the, you know, the lights and the streets and the police and all the stuff around you. And she goes, have you been to my neighborhood? There's, <laughs> there's no lights or police or street there. I'm not paying your taxes. And they said, you bring me the lights and the police in the street, I'll pay your taxes. Well, the, 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 the end of the story, which I won't bore you with, is she's now on the city council there involved in getting all that happening there. So I get those kind of stories where, where people get encouraged to make that happen. And then I see what happens with our, our daughter Lainey and Liesl and, and lots of people that just, it's life changing on both sides of the equation. What, I'll ask both of you, whichever one of you wants to go first, because this is another big question, but what do you want to see Opportunity International be and accomplish by 2020? I mean, I think being, first of all, continuing the great work that they're doing um, and just broadening their reach, truly. I think that, that being good, solid bankers, providing good, solid financial services, but expanding that reach to, to people in more rural populations um, in ways that are easy for them. So with brand, branchless banking, the mobile money applications that I know are, are um, growing and we'll hear more about today. Um, keep, sort of keep on doing what they're doing for more clients. Truly, I know it's a boring answer, but um, that's what I would really like to see. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's really important, and I've talked with Vicky about this uh, from time to time, to not, have, to not have mission drift, to expand, to grow, to add insurance, to add education, to add things, but not have mission drift. Mm -hmm. Because the people who did get loans from us 10 years ago and are now thriving and have their own businesses and are involved in the community and joining city councils, that's great. But there are lots of people in front of us who need that exact same opportunity they got 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We, so we have to not have too much mission drift. Um, the one thing, again, as a venture guy, the, the main thing you look at, we don't look at income statements and things like that as much as you think, because that's pretty boring. We really look at leadership and management. And with Carly chairing this, I have tremendous faith. With Vicki running this, I have tremendous faith. With all of you involved, um, I just think that uh, the biggest thing is, is to continue to keep the heart of service and the heart of servicing the poorest of the poor and being happy when they're too big, too successful, too thriving to be a client of ours anymore. Being thrilled about that moment and then going and looking for the poorest of the poor again. When they graduate. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank both of you so much, Lizelle, Kevin, for everything that you've done for Opportunity International, also for this panel today. It was a really interesting conversation. Mm -hmm.